2020 brought us Comet Neowise, the Great Conjunction, and a total solar eclipse, all causing a boom in interest in astronomy and astrophotography. So what does 2021 have in store for the night sky? We start the year with the Quadrantids meteor shower peaking between the 3rd and the 4th, and whilst they sometimes can produce up to 120 meteors per hour, they will be fighting with the gibbous moon this year, so you can expect those rates to be drastically decreased. The radiant point of the meteor shower is found within the constellation Bootes, so it's very much a northern hemisphere meteor shower. On the 10th, Mercury, Jupiter and Saturn will be within 2 degrees of each other very low on the southwestern horizon shortly after sunset, so you will need a very clear view of the southwestern horizon. Four days later, on the 14th, and the planets are joined by a thin, waxing crescent moon. But Jupiter and Saturn are increasingly becoming more difficult to view, and it won't be long before they head behind the Sun. On the 24th, Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation, where it will be 18.6 degrees away from the Sun, shining at magnitude minus 0.7. Again, it will be visible in the evening skies, in the southwest. February is a bit of a quiet month. It starts with the Alpha Centaurid meteor shower peaking on the 8th. The radiant point of the meteor shower is within the constellation Centaurus, so it favours the southern hemisphere. But it's a very minor meteor shower with only 3 to 4 meteors per hour max. But thankfully it's timed with a waning crescent moon, so viewing conditions are pretty good. The only naked eye visible planet readily available this month. It starts the evening high in the southwest and then heads down to the western horizon, setting at about 1 to 2 a.m. local time. And on the 18th, it's joined with a waxing crescent moon. And they are both found very close to Pleiades, the open star cluster, and Hyades, the cluster surrounding Aldebaran in the constellation Taurus. A day later, on the 19th, and the moon is directly in between Pleiades and Hyades. In March, the sun crosses the celestial equator on the 20th, bringing us the first equinox of the year, where day and night are of almost equal length all around the world. It's also a good month for those in the northern hemisphere to spot the zodiacal light. Dust and rocks in the ecliptic plane reflect the light of the sun into the night sky, and on moonless nights in areas free of light pollution, you will see a triangular diffuse glow of light emanating from the western horizon as darkness falls in the evening. Between the 10th and the 11th, a thin crescent moon passes by Saturn, Jupiter and Mercury in the eastern morning skies. This is also the time of year that Milky Way core season begins, and if you want to find out more about how to find the Milky Way from either the Northern or the Southern Hemisphere at any time of year, you should check out my video about finding the Milky Way all year round. Heading into April, when on the 17th there is a lunar occultation of Mars, where the Moon blocks the red planet from view. However, only the reappearance of Mars from behind the waxing crescent Moon will be visible for those in Southeast Asia. The Lyrid meteor shower peaks between the 22nd and 23rd, which is sadly timed with a waxing gibbous moon, but Lyrid meteors often leave persistent trains, so you may have some luck even through the moonlight. With the radiant point in the constellation Lyra, it heavily favours the northern hemisphere, and although the maximum rate is 18 per hour, you can expect that to be largely hindered by the waxing gibbous moon. May starts with another meteor shower, the Eta Aquarids, whose parent body is the famous Halley's Comet. Its radiant point is in constellation Aquarius, so there is an advantage for those in the Southern Hemisphere. And although the peak is said to be between the 5th and the 6th, it's quite a broad peak, lasting about a week that's centred on those dates. The Moon will be a waning crescent, which is certainly appreciated because the rates only hit 4 to 5 per hour. But that said, about 25% of the meteors leave persistent trains. On the 16th, Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation again, and it can be found in the evening skies, 22 degrees away from the Sun, shining at a magnitude of 0.3. On the 26th, there is a total lunar eclipse, the first lunar eclipse of the year. 
The whole eclipse is visible from Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia. Those in Eastern Asia can view the total eclipse during moonrise. And those in Western USA, Canada and South America will see the total eclipse during moonset. During a total lunar eclipse, the entire moon turns a gorgeous crimson red, often referred to as a blood moon. It also happens that this full moon is a supermoon, a full moon that's particularly close to Earth. And it's the largest full moon of the year as well, so I can't wait to see the headlines in the media of a total super flower blood moon eclipse. <laughs> On the same day as the eclipse, one of the two periodic comets predicted to be the brightest in 2021 reaches perihelion, its closest point to the Sun. The comet known as 7P Pons Wienek is a periodic comet with a six-year orbit and this year is only predicted to reach magnitude plus eight. So not even naked eye visible, but certainly visible with binoculars, telescopes and telephoto lenses. But it's likely to be nothing more than a diffused orb. It will be found in the constellation Aquarius in the evening skies, so it's visible from most of the world. Between the 28th and the 29th, Mercury... <laughs> Mercury... <laughs> Venus and Mercury will be less than half a degree apart, low in the evening skies. As we head into June, those at mid-high northern latitudes will now experience a perpetual twilight, so the skies never get completely dark. But it's also the start of noctilucent cloud season. So for the next two months, those between latitudes roughly 45 degrees north to 65 degrees north have a chance of seeing noctilucent clouds, also known as night shining clouds. For more information about noctilucent clouds, you should check out my full video about how to photograph noctilucent clouds, which I'll link above and down below. On the 10th, we have an annular solar eclipse. As the moon is close to apogee, its disk is not large enough to completely cover the sun, so you're left with what many call a ring of fire. Annularity lasts just under four minutes and is only visible from a thin path running through northeast Canada Greenland and a small part of Russia. Those in Europe, most of Asia and most of North America will still get to experience a partial solar eclipse where the moon covers a chunk of the sun. On the 21st we have the solstice, the longest day of the year for those in the northern hemisphere and the longest night of the year for those in the southern hemisphere. Between the 22nd and the 25th Mars shining at a magnitude of plus 1.7 passes in front of the beehive cluster also known as Praesipi. This will be a beautiful sight for binoculars, telescopes and telephoto lenses, but you should even make it out in wide-angle astrophotographs as well. A week later, on July the 2nd and the 3rd, it's Venus's turn to pass through the Beehive Cluster as it chases Mars through the sky. Venus, however, a lot brighter than Mars, shining at magnitude minus 4. Then a week or so later, on the 11th to the 13th, they will be joined in the evening skies by a thin crescent moon. And on the 13th, Venus and Mars will be just half a degree apart. As we head into August, Saturn reaches opposition. This is when Saturn is directly opposite the Sun for those of us here on Earth. So it's shining at its brightest at a magnitude of plus 0.2 and it will be visible all night long. On the 12th to the 13th, we see the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, which is set to be the best meteor shower of the year, as the maximum rates can reach 100 meteors per hour, and it's also timed with a waxing crescent moon. Perseid meteors tend to pick up in the pre-dawn hours, which is perfect because the waxing crescent moon would have set in the late evening. The radiant point is within the constellation Perseus, so there's certainly a big advantage to those in the northern hemisphere. On the 19th, Mars and Mercury will be less than 0.1 degrees apart. They will only be briefly visible in the western skies after sunset and you really need perfect weather and a clear view of the horizon, so it will be tough to observe. On the 20th, it's Jupiter's turn to reach opposition. Again, it will be directly opposite the Sun for those of us here on Earth, shining at its brightest at minus 2.9. A day later, on the night of the 21st, it will be just above a full moon. September brings another chance for those in mid to high northern latitudes to observe the zodiacal light, this time in the east just before sunrise. But again, it's best observed on moonless nights and with no light pollution in the east of your location. On the 23rd, we have the second and final equinox of the year, where day and night are of almost equal length all around the world. 
October starts with the peak of a minor meteor shower, the Draconid meteor shower, which normally has a maximum rate of about 5 per hour, but sometimes you can see unexpected increase in activity. The peak is set to fall on the evening of the 8th, and the Draconid is one of the old meteor showers that has higher rates in the evening hours rather than the pre-dawn hours. The radiant point of the meteor shower is within the constellation Draco, so it heavily favours the northern hemisphere. We also have the peak of the Southern Taurids meteor shower, which is only a minor meteor shower with about 5 per hour, and although the peak is set to be on the 10th, it's a pretty broad peak, with similar rates extending about a week centred on the 10th. The peak occurs around the time of a waxing crescent moon, so viewing conditions are pretty favourable, but the good thing about the Southern Taurids is a high percentage of the meteors are fireballs, slow-moving, bright meteors. The radiant point is within the constellation Taurus, so there is an advantage to those in the Northern Hemisphere. On the 25th, Mercury reaches greatest western elongation, and it's the best morning elongation of the year for those in the Northern Hemisphere. Watch it climb into the eastern skies before the sun rises. On November the 22nd, the comet known as 67P churumov gerasimenko reaches perihelion, its closest approach to the sun. It's the comet that was visited by the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission, and Rosetta's lander Philae became the first spacecraft to land on a comet's nucleus. During this month, it will be passing through the constellation Gemini, so it will be visible all around the world, but it's only predicted to be magnitude plus 8, which means it won't be naked eye visible, but it will look good through binoculars, telescopes, and telephoto lenses. And who knows, it might become brighter than expected. The comet has the notion P because it is a known periodic comet. There's always a chance of an unexpected comet with the notion C, like we saw last year with Comet Neowise. So fingers crossed we have another unexpected visitor sometime this year. On the 8th, there is a lunar occultation of Venus, but it's only visible from a small region in Eastern Asia. On the 12th, we see the peak of the second stream of Taurids, the Northern Taurids, and it's very similar to the Southern Taurids, although the peak is on November the 12th. It's a pretty broad peak, lasting about a week, where you see a maximum rate of about 5 meteors per hour, but a high percentage of those meteors will be fireballs. So even though the peak occurs around a waxing gibbous moon, you should have some luck in seeing some bright meteors fighting through the moonlight. The 19th brings the second lunar eclipse of the year, this time a partial lunar eclipse that is so close to being a total lunar eclipse as 97% of the moon will be engulfed by Earth's penumbral shadow. So the moon will still largely turn a gorgeous crimson red colour, but there will be a white cap at the bottom. The event is visible from North and South America, Australia and parts of Europe and Asia. On December the 4th, we have the second solar eclipse of the year, this time a total solar eclipse, but it's only visible from Antarctica, so only the most hardcore of eclipse chasers are going to be enjoying this one. From the 6th to the 9th, a crescent moon passes by Venus, Saturn, and also Jupiter, providing plenty of great photographic opportunities. On the 13th to the 14th, we see the peak of the Geminid meteor shower, which is normally one of the best meteor showers of the year, with 120 meteors per hour, but unfortunately this year, it falls around the same time as a waxing gibbous moon. That said, Geminid meteors tend to be slow and bright, so you may have some luck even through the moonlight. On the 21st, we have the second and final solstice of the year, the longest night of the year for those in the Northern Hemisphere, and the longest day of the year for those in the Southern Hemisphere. The year ends with four planets in evening skies, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter. Of the naked eye visible planets, only Mars is missing, but maybe he's the designated driver for the New Year's party. But from parts of Australia, you can witness a lunar occultation of Mars, on the 31st. And that's a wrap for 2021. Let me know in the comments below which event you're looking forward to the most. And make sure to hit subscribe if you want to catch some useful videos about how to photograph these events, or if you want to watch my astro vlogs of me photographing these events. As always, if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.